Gary, what time do you wake up in the morning? <laughs> uh, my, my discipline, ideally, would be to get up super early in the morning. To me, the most productive time of day by far is early morning, like five o'clock, five thirty, six would be late. As it is right now, I've been working on a, a hectic schedule, so it means I get to bed a little bit later. So I've been getting up around seven. Seven's pretty much my time to get up. When I'm writing the book or when I'm doing something special, then I rejig and I go to bed earlier and I get up early. Getting in two to three hours of productive time before the rest of the world's awake is the most delicious thing one can do for oneself. Agreed. Why do you wake up in the morning? Why do I wake up in the morning? I wake up in the morning because I'm excited about life. Because there's people and there's ideas and there's explorations to be had that day. Uh, because I have my ideas about what I want to get done but I'm not arrogant enough to believe that those are the necessarily the most important or the only things that will happen that day. But I just have an innate curiosity and I like to challenge myself. I'm more self-competitive, not so much competitive with others. Um, so to me, every day is an opportunity to see, you know, the question really comes down to one simple thing. How do you make that day matter? How do you make that day meaningful enough to be memorable? I love that, that you're competitive, but not in the sense that we hear a lot where you've got to be better than the next guy, which I know that that's true, but I like that. Talk about the difference between self-competition versus competition with everyone out there or perceived competition, and then you end up creating enemies or vice versa. The, the, the downside, the underbelly of co being com competitive by nature is that the tr traditional definition of competition has you in a perennial state of non-success. You just can't win at it. If I'm comparing my, I do CrossFit. The exercise of choice, at least in this moment for me in the last year, year and a half has been CrossFit. If I were competing with those around me at my gym, my gym's one of the best in the country. If I were competing against those in my gym, there's always gonna be people who are far, far, far more advanced, far superior athletically. They, their level of fitness is off the charts. They're monkeys, they're not even people. So if I were comparing myself to those people, I would, I would always be in a deficit. I'd always be thinking what's missing, what I haven't accomplished, right? But if I'm self-competitive, suddenly it flips the script. So now I'm looking at everybody who's working out, those 50 other people, 30 other people, 70 other people that are working out at the same time, and every one of them is an opportunity to pick up a trick and learn something and model, remodel something. I learn more by having relationships and dialogue and just observing these other people so that I can push myself further faster. So I'm, I don't look, I'm not in competition with them. I'm co in competition with my own sense of well-being and discipline and what, how do I push myself because I'll progress faster by not competing than by competing. Was that always the case? Because I notice a lot of younger people are very competitive, whereas I s tend to see people maybe after 40, they tend to realize like, you know what? No, I think that it's more about my goals and not comparing how well someone else is doing over me. Is that always the Yeah, case? I think we, we all come out of the womb competitive on some level, academically, athletically, uh, in terms of our looks and our social popularity and all sorts of, you know, yeah, absolutely. And that's a growing phase, you know, because there are the passages, I forget what they are. There's the, the athlete and there's the, you know, you grow into the statesman and then you grow into the, the community elder, whatever, the wise person, whatever. Uh, those are natural steps in our evolution as, as uh, in this life journey. Um, and I think age has a lot of advantages, but underneath all of that is a sense that I'm okay. Underneath all that is what I think is the, is, is the key to success and well-being, not just professionally, but personally, which is self-belief. It's okay to like yourself. It's okay to believe in yourself. It's okay to also be patient and give yourself permission to know that life is a process, not an event. It's not about a report card because that's a static idea. It's a snapshot 
that has nothing to do with your aspiration. Your aspiration is so much more. It's so more, more dimensional, more long-term. It's a vision. And if you don't, aren't driven by a vision and you're only looking at, it's like a corporation looking at quarterly profits and not doing the right thing long-term. What's best for the company, for the employees, for their stakeholders, and for the, and, and for the consumer. They're totally opposing views of life. So if you have self-belief and if you, can, if, you can, if you can really dig in and find within yourself and celebrate that which is, and sometimes people can't, oftentimes people can't, because they forget who they are. People forget how amazing and unique and special they are. I had an emergency room doctor years ago, I was giving a talk somewhere and he approached me afterward and basically was very lackluster, very low energy, compl complaining of himself that he was tremendously average. Um, and I asked him a few questions and it was shocking in the span of a few moments what I learned about this guy that was extraordinary. So he was responsible not only for being an ER doctor, which is already like, oh my gosh, but he was responsible for this large hospital, um, uh, it was a series of hospitals. He was in charge of um, the culture of the, of the hospital chain. All incoming nurses, all incoming doctors, all personnel of any stripe who came into this system, which is a system that welcomes on a daily basis people in trauma, people in fear, people in the most crucial critical moment of their life, surrounded by family who are equally concerned and upset and vulnerable. So he's the guy responsible for teaching doctors and nurses and everyone who's going to interface with the public how to be better at what they do, how to be more humane at what they do, how to understand and be empathetic in ways they might otherwise not have chosen to be. His impact on the lives of all the doctors, all the nurses, not to mention the thousands and thousands, countless numbers of people who trafficked through that environment on a daily, literally daily basis, is inestimable. It is not susceptible of measurement. It is beyond enormity, not just because of the numbers of people, but because of the impossibility of measuring how deeply crucial those moments are and how they are met. Here's a guy who thought he was boring. Here's a guy who thought, I'm, I'm just typical and average and what have you. So what I asked him to do as a personal favor, not really knowing me, was if he would go home and, and, and call upon three nurses and three doctors currently under the roof of this hospital, and three nurses and doctors who had, he had trained but had matriculated and gone on elsewhere in their life. It's a dozen people didn't have to be mathematically precise. Reach out to these kinds of people that you've had intimate interaction with and ask them not to respond in the moment, but to be thoughtful, think about it, and come back to you if they're willing and tell you the truth. And the truth is the answer to the following questions. Who am I to you? What influence have I had in your life? How have you altered your view or or habits or, or behaviors as a result of our interactions. What value do I represent? If any, good, bad, or indifferent. He called me a month later. He, he was like a changed man. He was ebullient. He was, his voice went up an octave. He was excited. He was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea who I was in the world in the eyes of so many people I respect. Anybody can do that exercise, we just don't think to do it. Going back to this emergency room doctor and this gentleman who was responsible for the culture of this large hospital, how do you think someone gets to that point where they actually are truly amazing and they do so much more than the average person does, but they see themselves as so less? Most successful people that I know, historically, are fairly modest people. They're fairly humble people. Um, but there are two categories of people. People who chide themselves for not being special or successful, despite their outward success, and those who embrace it.
I think one thing most, the majority of people walking the planet have in common is they take themselves for granted. They take their story for granted. They don't see what's truly innately special about them and thus what their contribution to the world or their community or their family or their friends might be. People who brag, people who are conceited, who are vain, that's not ascribing outsized value to the truth of who they are. That's superficial. That's an, that's an outside game, not an inside game. The inside game is the truth of who each of us is and we're all so different. If I tell my story truly in a Q&A or whatever environment, people are going to reflect back to me things that I ordinarily have brushed under the rug. And I'm caught up in the moment. I'm not even looking at where I've been and how I got to this moment. I think really successful people come in all different stripes. Some of them are very humble uh, because they understand how much work went into it and that it was a team sport. They didn't get there on their own. And, and, and I, I think what it comes down to really in a sense is, and age is a big help in this, is the secure person is, is, is more modest, a little bit more interested in the other. And if you're more interested in self and you're a little bit more braggadocio or you're a little bit more vain or whatever that is, um, you're, it, it just says that you're a little bit less secure. It's not a terrible thing. I'm not judgmental and I don't see it as good versus bad on a sliding scale. It's where each of us is on our path learning to be a better version of ourselves. Gary, do you live by a schedule? I live by a schedule not nearly so much as I ought. But I do. I do have certain things that I do in the morning, more morning, more often than not, uh, that are just uh, personal, private things that have nothing to do with work, that just set me on a path to, uh, toward a, a, a more positive, action-oriented day that make me feel good. So there, there are things, some of them are physical, some of them are not, some of them are dietary, some of them are not. Um, on a more macro scale, uh, I absolutely am much more disciplined now about making sure that my schedule has holes in it because I didn't used to. It used to be that I was so busy morning to night I could work seven days a week every week for weeks on end. Now I ensure that I have time for friends, I have time for proper meals, I have time where I'll take you know time to go to the zoo with my friend and their you know their kids or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah I think I think because the real work is not being busy. Um, the real work is, I'm a, I'm a businessman and I'm a creative person. And both are essential. And I think that, you know, we all, we all have that experience of, oh my God, this great idea came to me in the shower. Why? Why did that come in the shower? It came in the shower or when you're swimming or when you're distracted, when you're doing anything that completely removes you from your normal thought process as you're in the flow of work. And taking time off from work is probably the most work productive thing you can do. So a lot of my inspiration comes from having taken time away. Do you advise that to a lot of, let's say, new people who arrive in LA, New York, San Francisco, where they are so ready to like, you know, set the world on fire and kind of get their, you know, accolades under their belt? Um, what do you tell someone that maybe is just starting out and is so hungry and going back to younger people and being competitive? I, I, I would. I would. It's moderated though because when you're young and you're new and you're full of vigor and you're just ambition is like driving your every waking moment, that's okay. Go with it. But within that, let allow diversity. So if you're just doing the same one thing repeatedly, or if you're, for example, if you're a writer and all you do is stay home and write, not good. It's not healthy. You know, there's, there's, there's more legs to the stool. You've got to be out making relationships and you've got to be out learning the business. You've got to be out doing these other pieces of the puzzle so the picture forms well. You can't just do one thing repeatedly and hope for um, the kind of grand success that you envision, I don't think. I think I heard a quote one time from Jackie Gleason, and he said that his advice for like famous people or people that had kind of arrived in the industry was, don't stay in. 
Don't what? Don't stay in. Don't stay inside. Don't isolate. Yeah. Because that only leads to greater things down the line. And, and if you want to take a look at someone like maybe Elvis, who at, toward the end of his life, I think was more isolated and things like that. So as a creative person, you know, we want to think, well, we're working on our craft or whatever it is that we're doing. And if we're out there having fun, then that's, we're not being true to why we came here. Everyone has their own way. And I do think that some of the people I admire most, some of the things I, adm I appreciate about my own life is the, the persistent, consistent driver that is creativity in my life. I'm a, I'm, I'm a learner, I am an addict. So whether it's books or people, conversations or documentaries or whatever it might be, um, or travel. Or, and, and travel could be, you know, I was just in Europe or I was just in Nepal or I was just, or it could be traveling in this beautiful Los Angeles that is my, my little planet because there's so many layers and so many opportunities, some of which align perfectly with my work and some of which have nothing to do with it but inform me as a human being. And I do think that like I had a liberal arts education in college, the broader my inputs, the better off I am. I think getting too narrow uh, and too routine in your pursuits is probably not a success formula for most. Gary, out of the best scripts that you've read in your life and of those that have been made into films, on average, how long has it been between the time that you read the script and the time that the movie came out, kind of came to fruition? Oh, gosh, um, a long time? From the time that I've held a script in my hand, whether I'm the producer and I pr put it on the big screen or someone else's, it was someone else's child to raise, um, the, the length of stay between script and, and, and actual produced film varies so dramatically, and it's not necessarily based on budget, um, but, but there are so many. It's one of the most collaborative media um, one can imagine. You know, if I'm a fine artist, I can paint a painting without permission today. But if I want to make a film, and I want to make a film for, let's say, a million dollars, or a hundred million dollars, or five hundred thousand dollars, I need a lot of inputs. Uh, and I need a lot of preparation. My films, the fastest, I actually did several films, what I consider to be at breakneck pace, which was three years from script to screen. Pretty Woman was three years. Under Siege was three years. Um, there were there was a couple of indies that were less and some studio films that were longer um, uh, but but there is no there is no proper standard every film dies a thousand deaths some of them are deaths by paper cuts and some are death by massive train wrecks and then you resuscitate you move on and 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 you know, Forrest Gump reportedly was, I don't know, 13 or 15 years between script and screen. So you never, there's no, there's no rule. What is the best way for a writer to make a living as a writer in today's age, 2017? Doing rewrites, um, you know. I think, I think the best way for, if I were a writer today, if I were entering the business today, or I were in the business today as a writer, as a professional writer, um, I, th I think there are several things. Assuming, you know, listen, if you're David Kelly and you have that level of success, you already know your path. But if you're not yet David Kelly or you're not yet the equivalent of that on the feature film side, whatever that might be, um, if you don't have that little trophy on your shelf, uh, I think one of the great things you can do for yourself is to be more diversified. Now, I know that that's probably contrary to old school thinking which says specialize, become the best at one thing and known for one thing. But I think we are all today brands. Each and every one of us is brand building. And to the extent that we can, that involves audience, it involves public, it involves uh, our colleagues in the business. And um, so if, if you happen to be a writer and you want to do um, TV and film, that's okay. If you want to do uh, you know, apart from TV and film, if you want to be writing a blog, that's okay. If you want to be looking at creating uh, alternative content, or let's just say a TV series, uh, what, I won't use the word TV. If you want to create a series on YouTube, 
I absolutely applaud it because today the rules are out the window and people are looking for um, their talent in every conceivable corner, every nook and cranny. And a lot of that is social media. A lot of it is the unexpected. And, and, and the same is true in reverse. If you're selling ideas, you're no longer limited to selling to ABC, CBS, and NBC, or on the feature side of Paramount, Warner, Disney, Universal, et cetera. You have all of these other sort of counterculture approaches or, or the new Hollywood, if you will, and it's Hulu and it's Amazon and it's Netflix and it's, it's, it's Redbox and it's all these other companies that have uh, real meat on the bone, real distribution, real capital, uh, and, and, and then brands. You know, there's all these relationships with brand-driven stuff on, on, on social platforms. So I think the key question is not, uh, is, is to understand who you are as a creator, where you properly can succeed, where you are excited, uh, and where you think your audience lives. And consider those alternatives to while you're writing your Oscar candidate of a screenplay or whatever that thing is. How does someone find out which realm they're best in? TV, film? Well, what you, what you want to be and what you're good at are often at odds. You know, I mean, I'd love to be LeBron James. I'd love to be Yo-Yo Ma. I'd love to be a lot of people. Um, uh, but those aren't mine. What's mine is based on my skill sets, my experience. What, what excites me? What interests me? What, when, when my voice goes up an octave, it's because I'm in a conversation that I find absolutely irresistible. Know that about yourself. For some people, uh, the, for, for, for the lucky ones, what excites you is what you do. If it's not, but the beauty of a screenwriter or, or, or a writer in general, and all writers, it doesn't matter whether it's books or TV or film or any kind of writer. If you're a writer, you can choose to write about anything. You can be the person that you wanted to be without being it. You can make that area of inquiry substantively your world. Um, so as a creative, you have a little bit more freedom than most people do out in the workplace. Um, but I think if you pay attention to what excites you, and sometimes you just got to ask other people, what do you think excites me? You know me really well. <laughs> ask. Ask yourself, ask others, ask source. Whether I'm a screenwriter or some other form of creative, I think one of the key disciplines is to understand that discipline is key. And that is to say, when you, when you, you, you should find out what works best for you. Are you a morning person? Are you a late night writer? I, I, I'm, I'm not creative late at night. I like being up, but I'm not creative. I, I'm, I, I write like a fiend when I, when I have that early morning coffee, uh, because all night it's been percolating for me. That's not true for everybody, but if that's who you are, then make damn certain you've gone to bed at a reasonable hour and that you're up and you've done, gotten your stuff done and now at six in the morning or seven in the morning or whatever it is, you've set aside and you've turned your phone off and you have absolutely uh, sort of put these pr soundproof walls around you, literally and figuratively, so that you have two to three hours of intensely productive time on a consistent daily basis. If you do that, because it's a game of inches, and if you do that, instead of being the person who's laboring over a script and rewriting it three years, you know, nonstop, or you're doing a lot of first drafts and you're on your 12th script this year, those are not the indicators of success. But if you're someone who's got that kind of discipline and you say, how much can I, how much can I improve this? We know that rewriting is writing, but up to a point, you know, so how many drafts, you know, if I can do this every day and then I set it aside, move on to the next one, I may come back to that with proper inspiration. But if you do that, what you can accomplish in a short one year period will put to shame most people who don't have that discipline, who don't know themselves and give themselves a framework to be productive. Gary, what's the greatest script you've ever read and what happened to that script? Um, uh, 
You know, I've read a lot of what I would consider, I've been blessed to read a lot of great scripts. Um, and some of them never got made. Fortunately, many have. Um, I remember reading The Million Dollar Hotel by a friend of mine, um, uh, Nicholas Klein. And I was so f bottom, endlessly in love with that script and I wanted him to direct, he'd never directed. It ended up being directed by Vim Vendors. And in my estimation, I, I, it, was not, it, was, it, it didn't have the poetry that was Nicholas, that was infused in, in it because of who he was. No disrespect to Vim Vendors, he's a uh, you know, lauded filmmaker, of course. And, but, but so, you know, in that case, it kind of went one direction. Um, Pretty Woman, before it was Pretty Woman, 3000 by J.F. Lawton was certainly, I th certainly at that time it was the best script I'd ever held in my hands. And it was a dark drama, of course, but it was absolutely riveting, compelling, beautiful, in a in a in a sort of uh, you know tra tragic sense, uh, and of course, as we know, that film did get made. Only it got, and 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 ironically, the film got made so true to its original form, but just the structure and the characters and the dialogue was so taut that we didn't have to labor too hard to turn it tonally. And of course, we had Gary Marshall, so. <laughs> He could improv anything. Yeah, he, he, he filmed it as it was and then he did a little improv and we found that sort of comedy in it. Um, so that got made, again, in a totally unexpected direction. Originally it was going to be a dark, independent, you know, few million dollar film. So you never know. These things always take left turns. There's, um, but there have been a lot of great scripts, you know, sadly, that didn't get made. I remember there was a little film called The Cure um, that I was madly in love with, a very special care, a little small script, young characters. And uh, I had actually shared that with Steven Spielberg and his people flipped out and then Steven fell in love with it and we were cranking up the, the offer from Universal and, uh, Universal and Warner Brothers simultaneously. And, and the, the agent actually sold the script overnight to a third party and it got made years later as a low budget uh, kind of non-event. That was the biggest heartbreak personally for me. But you know, you never know. There are scripts that, um, and there are probably some scripts today that will st still haven't been made that will get made that I thought, that I think are amazing. It just, you, there's, no, there's no predicting this business. So what was it about that script that, that you said was eventually sold to a third party. I mean, what was it that just really resonated with you? Was it just a personal thing that you thought that you felt a connection to or the way it was written, the voice of the protagonist? It, 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 what was so remarkable about it was there are, there are characters and stories that are so gorgeous because of their truth because they call to us, they penetrate us in a way that's undeniable that we have, all of us had that experience growing up. And this was about growing up, young characters. Uh, and any, anyone who has blood flowing through their veins would have recognized some part of themselves or their friends in that story in a very poignant context. Uh, and, and because it was so universal, and so sweetly done. Not it wasn't a sweet picture. It was it was a challenging story. But it, what was sweet about it was the the attention to detail, the truth of how it played out. Before I moved to L.A., I was an attorney in San Francisco. It was a very respected position. It was a beautiful city. I had a great life. I had a nice income. I was set. And I was deeply comfortable and it scared the hell out of me. Had I stayed, I knew for certain about me, not true of all lawyers, not true of all people, what have you. I knew for me, I was going to wither from the inside, that that was not the right life choice for me on a soul level, on a spirit level, not a role level or a goal level, but on a soul level. 
it was I had to leave I had to flee I had to run away literally and so I did and I ran away and I uh, wasn't sure exactly how it was going to work out but I thought um, I'm going to go to the far end of the state to this crazy place called LA where I knew nobody uh, and I was going to pursue getting into the film business because I so love storytelling. I'd grown up inside of books. I was a lover of story. And most of my friends and colleagues, and certainly the other attorneys in the firm I worked at at the time, they all wagged their finger at me and said, how can you do that? Uh, that's so brave You're, or, or crazy or something. We don't understand. And I said to them, it's not brave, it's the opposite. It's, it's, it's survival. That for me to survive and thrive, I can't stay here. This is unsafe for me and it's unsafe because it's so comfortable. I need to go to this foreign land called Los Angeles. I need to go to a place where I'm anonymous and know nobody. I need to stretch my limbs. I need to see if I can make it in this very highly competitive unknown world of me of filmmaking. Because that lights me up from the inside out. I may fail. I may come crawling back on my knees begging you to take me back, oh friends of San Francisco. But on the other hand, if I don't do it, I will never know. And I'll always regret it. That's one version of many, many, many stories I could tell about, and that's just me. But I've seen it uh, uh, across most of uh, the people who've, uh, who've, who've been a part of my life, that this thing called the comfort zone is the most dangerous zip code you can live in. Because it's limiting by definition. You get inured, you become habit-driven, you become, um, you notice less. You become busy with that which is familiar and you build invisible walls around that experience. That becomes your longitude and your latitude. As opposed to self-defining as an adventurer, as an explorer, as someone who is going to be a maverick and do the things that truly, truly express more deeply who you are. And that cannot be the same thing when you're 17 as it is when you're 40 as it is when you're 80. We are designed to evolve. We are designed to change. The world changes whether we like it or not. It's good of us to understand that that's something to be embraced. And it's like our friend. It's not our enemy. It's not poison to our spirit. It's the opposite. It's an elixir. I've had multiple careers and I don't think I'm done yet, you know, and that's why, because I can't predict what my appetites will be 24 months from now or five or 10 years from now. I know what I'm doing right now is exciting to me, um, but it always involves exploration. It always involves, and, and I, I say that not as a, necessarily as a physical reality, but as a, in, in, an emotional, psychological educational reality you know like who how can I be a better version of me that's the job really for all of us in life how do we become a better version of ourselves and since we spend a majority of our waking hours in the in the, in the service of this thing we call work and livelihood boy what a great tapestry to, 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 to make sure that what you're doing expands you so let's say someone has made a bold move to come from wherever to LA and New York, one of these major cities, but then they've been here several years and now they're in a new kind of rut, new kind of comfort zone. Yeah, I'm going out, I'm submitting, fill in the blank of whatever it is they're submitting, but it's habit driven and it's not really going anywhere and they feel stagnant. But to everyone else, hey, they're here in this big city or wherever and they're supposedly working, they're supposedly getting stuff out there. How do you shake that up? And I know I'm being a little bit vague, but let's just say they're here. It's not vague. Okay. If, if you want to learn to play tennis, find yourself a pro. That's the game. That's how you improve. The problem most creatives have when, you know, they, 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 they come to LA, they come to New York, they go wherever they are, and they, what do they do? Most of them learn bad habits. 
Why? Because they're learning and mimicking like people around them. I'm an actor, I'm following what other actors are doing. I'm, I'm asking them, I'm learning from them, and yet they're not at the top of the totem. Same with writers, same with producers, same with, the, doesn't matter, human beings. Writers, as one example, um, I get query letters every day, blind query letters. Dear so-and-so, it could be my name, it could be creative executive, it could be my name misspelled, it could be anything. Dear so-and-so, log line, short description, you know, can I send you a script? I'll sign a release. Sign John. That's what I get repeatedly all day long in my inbox. There is not one lick of research. There is not one lick of anything personal, like why is this the writer, the only writer who could have written this story? Why was it so compelling that they chose this out of all the stories in one's imagination? Why did they choose to send it to me? Now, I don't want to receive the agony and the ecstasy as a letter, but something, a drop, a kernel, something that stands out and makes them, makes me think, makes me react, makes me wonder about this. Um, but they don't. I can promise you not even 1% do what I'm describing. So this is what writers learn from other writers. It could be actors learning from other actors, etc. They learn the habitual, tried and true, day-to-day -day protocol, which is usually very unsuccessful. The, the ROI, the return on investment in sending blind query letters is gonna be horribly frustrating. If you're a business, you'd be bankrupt. So why do it? You do it because this is what other people are doing. You need to associate with, with more successful people. And you need to think about it differently. If you were a fashion designer and you took that approach, you focus on your craft, focus on your craft, focus on your craft, and send out letters saying, here's my designs, aren't I great? You'd never have a brand. You have to think in terms of business. You have to think in terms of um, what, what more could I do that others aren't doing as opposed to what they are doing? How do I stand out? Se separating yourself out from the herd is definitely the name of the game. And anyone who's invested all that blood, blood sweat and tears, that sort of soul equity, investing all that time writing 120 or 10 pages, whatever, of, of story and rewriting it till it's just so that they want to share their wares with the world. Now they're so proud of this. They should, they should invest a like amount of time in figuring out how to market and how to be a business person and how to reach out to people, how to do things differently than all their peers. Like that's a great measurement. Am I doing what everyone else is doing or am I being somehow putting myself out into the world and speaking of myself to the right people in ways that matter? You mentioned fashion. It had me thinking of Diane von Furstenberg and her wrap dress and how it was this dress that no one had really ever seen it and it fit every body type. It made every body type look good. So I just, I don't know, you're talking about fashion, so I'm thinking about that. Um, okay. yeah, how many times do we see artists, Steve Jobs, Johnny Cash, you know, I mean, Lady Gaga, you know, I mean, it's, there's a million ways to stand out. Every creative person should consider themselves primarily responsible for the success of their career. Is that true? It is an absolutely true statement that every creative person needs to be the primarily responsible person who stewards their own career, who is the architect. It's great if you have others with their oars in the water helping you. It's great if you have an agent, it's great if you have a manager, if you have an attorney, if you have other people who are mentors or wear different hats in your life. Uh, who contribute strategy, time, effort, money, whatever all those things are. All contributions, smart and well-intended contributions are welcome, of course. But the statement that we hear so often from a creative, if only I had an agent, is an unfortunate statement in my view. Because even when you have one, you're still 100% responsible. When I was a personal manager representing primarily writers and directors, some actors, but when I was a literary manager, my attitude was, first I had to deal with my writer. 
you work as hard at being a writer as I work as being your representative, and we're going to get along great. But by the way, you're still 100% responsible for your career. And by the way, so am I. I'm 100% responsible for your career. And when we get you an agent, the agent's 100% responsible for your career. Now we got 300%. Sounds like the producers. But it's true. I could never allow anyone to be even 1% responsible or I wasn't doing my, giving my all. So when they get an agent, when they get a manager, when they get people who want to jump on board, that's great, but it's frosting, it's not the cake. They have to be the one because you know what? At the end of the day, it's their personality, it's their talent, it's their signature in the world that is going to win the day. An agent can only open a door, make an introduction, set the table, but the writer or the actor or whomever has to walk into the room, literally and metaphorically, and win the day. It has to be their vision, it has to be their voice, it has to be their style, it has to be their personality and energy that seduces the universe into saying, yeah, I want to play with you. Your dream's going to get, make, we're, we're going to make your dream come true. Because what you bring with you, not because your agent said X or your manager did Y, that's not the truth. The truth is they just opened a door, which by the way, you could have opened on your own had you uh, understood that you could open it on your own. But yeah, the talent can't just be the talent. The talent has to understand, even if, if it's not about how many hours a day they invest on the business side of their, their, their life. It's, it's more deeper, it's deeper than that. It's an understanding that I'm going to will this into being. I'm going to will people into my life who are going to help me. I'm going to will new relationships into my life. I'm going to take action that pays dividends. So if you had a performer, a writer, what have you, in your chair and you're, they're, they're sort of slumped down and they're saying, you know, this just isn't working and I have this agent and manager and they're not sending me out or they're not, you know, whatever, it's they. They're, they're putting the blame on they, the other person. What would you say to them? Make them wrong. Show them how it gets done. You want to complain about your agent, your manager, not getting you auditions or whatever it happens to be? Great. Show them how to kick up some dust and get yourself the audition. It's not okay to sit home and complain. You know, the glass isn't half empty. Ever, 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 ever. You know, we're all, we're all, we're all allowed our moment. We're all allowed to have that one day or that, preferably that one hour, right? Then you have to dust yourself off and say, success is about moving on with it. And if other people aren't getting it done for you, then, then you've got to motivate them. And the best way to motivate someone is to show them what they're not doing by doing it yourself. Ah, there's a wonderful quote. It's escaping me at the moment. A great science fiction writer, I believe it was who said, you know, you can't, you can't allow your manuscripts to, 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 to gather dust in a, in, a, in a dresser drawer. Let's talk about marketing a screenplay. When does it happen? How important is it? How does a screenwriter do it effectively? It's not important. It's essential. It's crucial. It is life-affirming and it is absolutely re the responsibility of any talent, any creative, to market themselves. If it's a writer and there's a script or a book or some, some, some product, um, time to market it. That's what you've got to do. And here's what most people don't understand. It should be, and it is, fun. It's fun. If I take that same writer to a cocktail party and I put a drink in their hand and say, tell these people they're fascinated by you and what you do, talk about that, they're going to talk nonstop. They will, you will not be able to shut them up. But if you, on the other hand, say, ah, you've got a script, you're at home, pick up the phone and call someone, no, they don't want to do it. Suddenly, marketing's a negative, it's a bad thing. It's all in how you perceive it. Marketing and sharing your talent with the world should be a joy, it should be your purpose. The problem is, people think so narrowly 
99.9% of writers who have a screenplay ready to go to market, they've rewritten it, it's ready, they've tested it, beautiful. What do they do? They automatically think, I need to send it to agents, I need to send it to producers, and then they stop. The thought ends. Oh my gosh, that does sound like not a lot of fun. Because who are the people getting all the scripts? Producers and agents. I would look at it and say, let me research this. What are the kinds of projects that are exciting, that have been produced, successful projects that people love, that are similar over the last handful of years, whether it's TV, film, or whatever? And I'll make a list, and I'll do a spreadsheet, and I'll list the cinematographer and the editor and the script supervisor and the casting director and everybody but the producer and the agent. And I will start calling them and reach out to their assistants and saying, I'm calling because, oh my God, you guys were involved with one of my favorite projects of all time. Um, I so admire the work. And I have something spiritually very similar. Um, I'd love your advice. Would you be my five minute mentor? Would you play with me on this a little bit? There are endless conversations that you can have. You develop rapport with people because you share a common interest. That's the key. And if you can get them interested in a conversation, then you can get them soon on the third call interested in reading your script. You're not asking anything of them. When you call an agent, you're asking them to represent you. That's a huge ask. When you send your script to a producer, you're saying, will you produce this? Oh my God, that's the biggest ask of any. Because what that means is that the producer has to invest several years of, on, uh, on, on, on their own dime to create value and make this a reality. When you ask a, an agent to represent you or a producer to produce your film, you have to understand there's almost nothing in it for them at the outset. They're going to invest their time and their belief and their relationships on your behalf for no money. That's the reality. But if you make it about something else, if you make it about a shared common interest that's exciting and fun, and those people can become your ambassadors and backdoor that script over to that agent or that script over. It comes in a different package. It comes in a different context. That's where magic happens. That's where alchemy kicks in. I could talk about that for about three days. Gary, I sense from you such like an open, abundance mindset. Did you always think like this? Did you always feel like things were unlimited? That there was no, there was no, a lot of us just think in terms of a box, myself included. It's, and I, I don't see that from you. I see that the, you see endless possibilities and there's never a black and white answer. There's a lot of gray. My world is entirely gray. There's no black and white. Um, and it is a about endless possibility. It's, it's what you make of it. I came to Hollywood wide-eyed, rose-colored glass. And by the way, I'm still wearing rose-colored glasses. I will be the eternal optimist till the day I, I leave this life because it's a better choice for me. But when someone says no to the thing about moving to, to LA to try and get into the film business, they spent years getting no, a lot of no's, hundreds of thousands of no's. In a very rare instance, I might get a yes. But the no's so outweighed it. You know, it's interesting. There was a book um, by Jeff Olson called the, the Slight Edge. And in that book, he talks about social science studies have proven that a child by the age of five has heard the word no 40,000 times. And he's heard that same child has heard the word yes by uh, 8,000 8, times. 40,000 no's, 8,000 yeses. Five times the gravity holding that child down as the buoyant yes, uplifting that child's mindset and, and sense of possibility. That's a formative time. So they enter the first grade with, with that energy. Quite a deficit there. Imagine the possibility if that were reversed. How would that kid enter into, so into, 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 into his social, new social environments. But be that as it may, I see the world as endless possibility. When someone says no to me, I've heard it so many times that I've gone deaf. I am literally deaf to the word. So to me, when you say no to me, I'm smiling and I'm excited. Why? Because it's the same as a yes. I choose it to be the same as a yes. Why? I know that no is not yes. 
But what I do know is that the greater currency, whatever you were going to say yes to, it would have been nice. It would have made me happy. But the real win is my relationship to you, with you. So if I can take that no and honor you by saying, fantastic. First of all, I've taken all the, you know, people don't like to say no. It makes them feel terrible and they feel guilty and this and that. But if I take that away right off the table by going, oh my God, great, and surprise them, well, new, new rules, right? So I can say to them, that's fabulous. You know, it would, you have no idea the value that you would bring to my life, that you would honor me if you would be my, my 3.7 minute mentor right now, my five minute mentor. If you could share with me why this is a no to you, I would be eternally grateful. Now you've, you've opened the door to them telling you the truth. They're not going to say no. You've flattered them. You've honored them. You've made them smile, hopefully made them laugh. And you're being honest. And they know that. We know when someone's being honest with us. And now out comes the thing called empathy. And that thing called caring. So they'll tell you. And A, you will learn something important. And B, that ineffable thing happens. We as two people have just bonded in an entirely higher context. I've left the room with a no and a friend a no and a closer relationship and a new mentor. You do that a hundred times over the course of a couple of years, success is inevitable because people who care about you who are more successful will ensure that. That's the way, that's the way it works. Have you had a no then come back a year, two, three, whatever later and say, you know what, Gary, remember we talked? I was just wondering, this, this is different from when we last, you know, and, and it kept the relationship or it kept the meeting in a good standing. There was no negativity, kept it upbeat. And then they came back to you and it turned out there was something else that they thought of you for. How you approach people determines how they feel about you, not just in the moment, but ongoing. I've ha I have had a lot of people over time come back with opportunity in a different form a different time, a different place, a different topic, a different project, if you will, um, and invite me into a conversation that was largely the result of earlier interactions. And those interactions left them with a positive feeling. I didn't make them feel bad. I, I quite the opposite. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that, that's what success looks like to me. Success to me looks like a, a string of pearls, human relationships that were dealt with well in the moment. Because now people are talking about me behind my back, but in a good way, or thinking about me, perhaps in a better way, um, and, and, and then remembering me because of it. And, and I think we all do that. We, we, um, we, like, we like to do business with people that we like, that we respect, that we trust that we know how they're gonna behave. If I deliver bad news to you and you come back in a positive way to me, I know that you're the writer I want in a writer room at 3 a.m. in the morning when things are really tough and getting ugly and I can count on you to still be a human being. That does matter. You will always get hired over the slightly more talented writer if I don't trust that to be true about them but I do trust that to be true about you. That's how we're wired. Let's talk about planning, and I think you've said in your book, starting without a plan is a recipe for frustration, confusion, and failure. Do most people plan for their entertainment careers? I mean, did you plan when you left San Francisco? You've been an attorney, you're used to planning out probably your schedule and all the caseloads that you're going to be talking to for the day, or maybe not, I don't know, but, but structure is very important to an attorney's work, I know. So you come here thinking it's going to be a different world, were you planning? Or did, is that something you learned over time? You know, I don't think I was, at the outset, I don't think I was that different from others who s embark on a creative career. Um, I had been an attorney, yes, uh, where there's an inordinate amount of study and preparation and discipline and, 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 and you schedule your life out. and you, you walk into, you open a door called creativity 
and everything suddenly seems mysterious and random and chaotic and uncertain and there's no footprints in the sand. Or so it seems. And I think that's true for most people. It was a little, it was certainly true for me to an extent. Until you realize, and hopefully you do quickly come to realize, that's not true. That there are footprints in the sand that a lot of people have come before you. And all you have to do is think of it as as a business. And if you do, you will save yourself a lot of time. Because you'll take all the wonder and mystery and anxiety out of it and say, oh, people have done this for decades and decades. Yeah, there's some new technology and there's, you know, we're using different kinds of editing equipment. <laughs> but fundamentally, the, the, the human experience is the human experience. Um, when I learned that, oh, I can choose to be a manager and I can, you know, the, the, I started to develop the, the rigor of discipline, right? And say, oh, I'm gonna have this many meetings a day and I'm gonna have an office and I'm gonna have, um, I'm gonna adopt certain practices. Um, then it started allowing me to really flourish. Until then I was just sort of rambling around, talking to random people about random things, hoping for some spark of enlightenment, some inspiration. Um, but I think you have to sort of begin to anchor yourself, batten down the hatches and say, no, I know I want to be a writer or I know I want to be an actor or I want to be a producer, whatever I want to be, and I am going to mimic and I'm going to learn from, and again, it's the same thing we were talking about before. I'm going to reach out to some people and ask them to be my five minute mentor and I'm going to ask uh, myself to mimic what I learned from them uh, and start to develop that as a, as a rigor, as a habit, as a discipline, and set, set guardrails down so that I know that I'm moving in one direction forward. In terms of uh, planning, where do you think people go wrong? Like, I, I see a lot of people, and myself included, the day gets away from them. And that's something that I've really had to work on for myself. And I see it in a lot of other people too, because we're creative, we go with what feels good, we go on a whim, a spark. Well, there is a galaxy, not a world of difference, between <laughs> planning and a to-do list. A to-do list is useless because any, any slight breeze will blow it away. Anything can interfere with that because you're not committed to it. It's not a plan. It's just a list. It's like a shopping list. Maybe I'll even get to the grocery, maybe I won't. When you have a plan, it means that I'm gonna prioritize the things that really matter to me. If, if nothing else, I'm gonna get these three things done and I'm gonna get them done first, not second or third or fourth. I'm gonna get them first. My morning is going to be consist of A, B, and C. I don't even set meetings usually until the afternoon because I need the morning hours to do what I need to do, what I've promised myself, the things that I've planned. Because the night before, and that's part of my discipline, is the night before I make a call sheet, I make a list. What are the top priorities? Yes, there's a bunch of calls I could make and some other things I could do and will eventually get around to, but these are the three or the five or the two or the seven inviolable things. These will get done tomorrow. So I'm gonna put them at the top of my, my agenda. I'm gonna start on them early in the morning and by lunchtime they should be done. What happens in the afternoon can have a flow. I can be spontaneous. I can say, oh, forget that, I'm gonna do this. But if you, if, you, if you haven't anchored yourself in a plan, in a, and that plan is not only what are you going to do, but when are you going to do it, and you know, how are you going to structure your day, and how do you have a value system? How do, you, how do you know to say yes or no to that person? Do I go to a coffee meeting with this person? Nine times out of ten, I'm going to say no, because it doesn't rank high enough on my list of, of value. Well, you talked about, too, in your book, I think, people keeping busy. And so it seems like they're doing things, they're working toward their career, but in actuality, they're spinning wheels, they're, they're kind of wasting time. What are some of those things that we often think that, hey, you know, I'm out here, I'm, I'm, I'm working hard at this. You know, how you doing, son? How you doing, you know? Yeah. Whatever, daughter, you, you're out there working. Oh yeah, I'm meeting with people, I'm doing this, yeah. I'm doing that, I'm pitching this. I think most, <laughs> of, most of us are really, I think, unfortunately miseducated. And we're taught to delude ourselves. The person who's super busy is important. They're on their way to something big. As opposed to the person 
uh, who's productive, which may not look busy at all. You know, there's an old there's an old idea that um, has been around since the dawn of time, which is that we should we should spend less time doing and more time imagining, seeing clear as a bell that which we want to occur in our lives. And that could be the person I want to meet, the amount of money I want to make, the kind of home I want to live in. I mean, imagine it down to the finest nuance, in detail, in technicolor. I would rather spend an hour in the morning imagining, envisioning, than being so busy doing little tasks that I forget where I'm going. I forget my direction. Um, so b busy, is, busy is not something to be applauded in my world. Being productive is, and sometimes being productive and busy happen at the same time. You know, when you're in production, you are busy, but you also know that it's mapped out. That day, you're gonna get all your shots on your shot list. You're gonna look at dailies. You're gonna take these kinds of creative meetings. That's busy, but you're also being productive. If they go together, hallelujah. But unfortunately, I think a lot of us, and I've been guilty of it in the past, God knows, of being so busy that I sort of forgot what was important what I really needed to get done. And I certainly didn't, wasn't thinking about, is this line up with my, with my ultimate vision? Is this like creative visualization? Like Shakti Guan, or I'm saying her name wrong, but she, she wrote um, a book on that. And yeah, I suppose. I mean, I've never, I've never been one to do vision boards or, you know. <laughs> no. But um, you're thinking, but, but thinking, it's, it's about manifestation and sort of law of attraction. I mean, you're thinking. Yeah, and, listen, I, you know, a lot of that stuff's been um, what, what's the uh, uh, hijacked? I mean, it's it's just been repackaged in these new age. You know, do the vision board, do this, do that. It's as old as the hills. This is it goes. It's it's part it's part of mysticism. Every mystical tradition um, has some form of this silver thread woven into the fabric of their belief. Just to follow up on, on what we were talking about, you know, there's two schools of thought. You have people that say you can't be so precious about the work, you can't hold it so tightly and be so paranoid, and then you have someone like a Steve Jobs who is incredibly secretive. You wouldn't know sometimes what was coming out, or there were, you know, rumors amidst Apple, whatever, and we wouldn't know until years later sometimes with things, mm -hmm. which obviously worked out for him in many ways. So. It's an interesting mix. How do we kind of go in the middle where we're not too paranoid, too precious? I mean, I see sometimes filmmakers won't even have their, their trailer embeddable. They, they won't even make it so people can embed them on, a, on a <laughs> someone else's website because they're, they're afraid or whatever. Maybe they just didn't click the, the button. But to that level versus someone that's an open book that is unfortunately easily taken advantage of, and I'm not saying that happened in your case, but I mean, believing in the good of people because they're good, you know, I think there's a, there's a fine line. Yeah, I mean, I, look, there's two sides to every idea. Um, and, and, and one is knowing the time and the place. So, uh, for example, a lot of filmmakers hold their cards so close to their vest or their chest uh, that it's self-defeating. Classic example, most studio executives in the marketing department will tell you that they are considered Satan by filmmakers. Filmmakers will not share one iota about their film, one frame of their film, until it's absolutely locked and loaded. Which means that the marketing department has precious little time to really think about and be creative and come up with great concepts and execute on those. It's a last minute 11th hour deal and it almost always is, right? Is that in the filmmaker's best interest? I suspect not. Um, I know that when um, uh, many, many years ago I did a picture at Universal, young writer-director, his first directing gig, and together we went in with storyboards and, we, and, I, and I insisted that we have someone from every department present or two people from every department, whatever could show up. We had like 16 or 18 people in the room representing every conceivable area of marketing. And we presented to them and said, look, we just came to say hi. We want to know what you do, and we want you to uh, be aware of our little project because it's not the biggest on your lot. And so if you could, we just want to share with you a little bit about the genesis, the history of the project. We want to share some storyboards. By the way, the storyboards suck, and you guys are so much smarter, but it was just 
some, a way we could communicate to you. But most importantly, before we leave, after we've shut up and we've had some Q&A, what we really want from you is we want your guidance telling us, while we're out on location shooting, what do we need to bring back? What do you need to do your job better? What kind of still images, what kind of B-roll? What do we need to bring to you so that you can be the best? They literally said to us, we're veterans, we've been here 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, whatever. We've never ever had filmmakers conduct this kind of a meeting. That was at Universal Pictures. Wow, okay. So there, there's, there, is, there is clearly this sort of tradition in, in, in the human race to hold very, very dear, uh, to keep very private our, what we consider our IP, our baby. And I think sometimes it's service and sometimes it's, it's self-defeating. You know, it's, uh, you know, but I, I, I think you just have to sort of be sober about it and, 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 you know, look at what other successful people do and how they do it. And um, the flip side of that is I never worry that much about people stealing what I have. I have this crazy idea that each of us is so gifted and special in the way that we would do something that no one could steal any of my ideas and, and do it the way I would do it. Let them, let them do their version of it. You know? So I can write a book or I can produce a movie or I can, I can nurture a recording artist or whatever those things are. An idea is worth very, very little in Hollywood. It's the people and, 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 and their ability to deliver on an idea and birth out of nothing. That's what we do. We birth out of thin air something very concrete, very compelling, hopefully, that moves people, happily or sadly. Um, I think it's the doer, not the idea. So I think theft is actually an interesting concept in a world of IP. And I don't really take out an insurance policy. I don't worry about it. I don't think about it. Gary, what do you think is the biggest mistake a screenwriter can make? I think. I don't know about the biggest mistake a writer can make. There are a lot of mistakes writers can and do make. Um, one of them is being a bit inebriated and, and, and too grand about their work in the way they communicate it to the world. No one wants to, people want to discover, they want to be Columbus discovering the new world. And if you overstate the new world and that you've already developed and built hotels and the, what they're going to find and they should come and it takes all the fun out of being the, the Christopher Columbus. Um, so I would say be, be, you know, be authentic, be persuasive, but, but don't overstate. Um, I think another mistake that writers can make is believing that other people know more than you. Believing that other people know the right way to do things or a better way to do things. It's like, no, you know yourself, you know your project better than anyone. Um, and you should, if you check with your gut and your brain both, be fully capable and competent to figure out the best way to put that out into the market and market it and tell the story around it. No one can be you. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of mistakes that writers can make. One of them is, is, is wasting time and, and not being as disciplined as they should be about their output. Um, one of them is, is certainly thinking that there's such a thing as perfection. Hogwash, you know? Um, you, there's, there's a point at which, um, I know people who've been rewriting a book or a script or something for literally years, plural, and that's not a good sign. Uh, so I think there's, you know, look, all of us are capable of making lots of different kinds of mistakes. I think common sense sort of is the answer to most of them. Well, I mean, Susan Cain, she's an attorney and she wrote um, Quiet. Quiet, yeah. And she talked about how she took seven years, I think, to work on the book, but she loved the process. And that was part of her being an introvert 
and that's what the book is about as is, is is just delving into sort of this own wor her own little world and writing and researching and all of that was so seductive to her whereas knowing that she had to get it out there well that was something that's the total sort of her yeah, it's horror <laughs> to introverts i mean we cringe at that stuff <laughs> Everyone's different. There's, you know, you're asking me, you know, by the nature of an interview, you're asking me questions that are as broadly applicable, hopefully, as they can be. And, you know, what's true of Susan Cain or J.K. Rowling or this one or that one is not going to be true for 90% of the audience. You know, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing about a Susan Cain and certain others is um, they kept genuinely enhancing and improving and putting more meat on the bone. Susan didn't waste the last three years out of those seven years just cuddling her manuscript, <laughs> right? It wa that wasn't her process. Um, but, but most people who spend seven years on anything, I can almost guarantee you, have wasted a lot of time. Right. It's very individual. Well, just wrapping up, just quickly, you had said something earlier about, you know, the person who's too grandiose versus then the person who thinks that they everyone else knows more than they and David and I happen to be having a very similar conversation in the car about how there's just kind of almost like two types of people and I've said it before in interviews but finding that middle ground because you you know the braggart you know the one that's this is the next best thing and that person's usually at a cocktail party and that's the one you move away from and then you know the one that probably has a lot of really interesting things to say but you can't get it out of them because they don't believe in themselves and they're closed off their arms are closed and it's almost like they want to go into a corner. So how do we, how do we find that middle balance? Because I think a lot of times these personality types don't know that they are that way. And I, and I think it, if you could take that braggart and make them a little more, take them down on the scale. I'd rather take the quiet one and make them talk a little more. Make them more grandiose? Yeah, because I, I can guarantee it. The, 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 the person who's, and we, I get this a lot, you know, and here's the good news. It's not just a script, it's a trilogy. And guess what? I've already figured out the merchandising. And guess what? It's guaranteed to make $100 million at the box office. You are so lucky that I'm offering you this project. It's like, please get out of my inbox. Um, that's never going to happen. I remember Lily Tartikoff, after Brandon Tartikoff died, who was almost unparalleled in um, for who he was and how people embraced him. He was beloved. Everything about him, his intelligence, his creativity, his personality, his very down-to-earth, quiet ways, charming, and created the most successful network in the history of television and brought more innovation to, to bear than anyone who had come before. And I remember Lily Tartikoff in an interview talking about, she, was at, she met him at this big party. I think it was at Lou Wasserman's or some, some big person's home. And everybody else was very, you know, in the moment. And there was this one guy, very quiet guy, off in the corner, sort of keeping to himself, really not talking. And she just zeroed in on him and said, that's the one, right? And went over and met him, and sure enough, right? J.F. Lawton was the same way. I met Lawton not because he was a writer. I hired him to program my Macintosh, which was, you know, like in the mid-80s. It was one of the first ones, and you, you couldn't plug the sucker in. It didn't do anything. <laughs> um, and a writer friend of mine happened to use the Mac, and I asked, how did you, who programmed that? And she said, this guy. I called this guy, and it was J.F. Lawton. He literally sat by my side, worked in my office nonstop for three weeks, programming, learning everything about my life, what I did, how I did it, what I wanted, what I needed. He knew everything about it. So he knew my work, but he never mentioned that he was a writer. He had seven scripts sitting in his little one-room one studio. Um, he was that quiet, brilliant, um, shy, guy who was just, he was so gifted, it was ridiculous. But you had to pull it out of him. And I did. <laughs> but
but you have to sort of just notice things. You know, there's, there's this wonderful, uh, Daniel Goleman who wrote Emotional Intelligence uh, gave a talk and he talks about, I forget what campus, it was a campus back east somewhere in the United States where they have a, a seminary as well. And they did an experiment. And in this experiment, they divided the seminary students into uh, two groups. And they told both groups that they were going to develop and deliver that same day a sermon. But to the control group A, they said, on any topic of your choosing. But to control group B, they said, you're going to deliver a sermon based on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, we all know the parable of the Good Samaritan. So they were both sent off to, to spend a certain amount of time crafting their sermon. And after a certain amount of time, they were told, okay, it's time to leave. We're gonna to go to the chapel, which is the far side of the campus. And they were gonna walk these curving walkways across campus to the, to the chapel. And so they did. But along the path, right off the walkway, on the lawn, writhing in fetal position was a somewhat older man, obviously in bad shape, in pain. The study was to see how many and which students stopped and why. And those who didn't stop, why didn't they stop? One would logically think that those who stopped were the ones who were writing the parable about the parable of the Good Samaritan because that was their mindset. But that wasn't at all true. What was true is that of those who stopped and those who didn't, there was one consistent reality. The students who did not feel prepared, who were anxious, who were consumed, who were not ready to deliver their sermon, who were lost in their thoughts about what am I going to do, they didn't notice this person on the ground. They literally didn't notice. And so they continued along the walkway. The students who felt ready, confident, self-contained about this idea, they walked and they were observing and noticing everything around them because they were free and present. And they noticed this man on the ground writhing in pain and they stopped. It had nothing to do with the Good Samaritan. It had to do with the fact that we in the modern age notice so much less because we're so busy on so many levels that we miss a lot of life. We miss opportunity, we miss people, we miss community, we miss so much just because we don't notice. I would say there's, this, there's, there's a lesson in there for those who aspire to a creative career. but I wouldn't say that to them. <laughs> <laughs>